Welcome to episode 193 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Peter Ahern, who served in the FBI for 29 years. During his career, he served in a variety of positions of increasing responsibility. His last promotion before he retired was to special agent in charge of the Buffalo Division. In this episode, Peter Ahern reviews the Lackawanna 6 terrorism case and provides insight into the challenges of managing a major international terrorism investigation initiated just a few months before the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. The Lackawanna 6 case was initiated after an anonymous letter was received claiming that several individuals, U.S. citizens, identified by name and residing in Lackawanna, New York, an area near Buffalo, had attended training camps in Afghanistan operated by Osama bin Laden. The investigation received intensive national attention. During his tenure as the SAC in Buffalo, the field office and agents assigned received multiple FBI Director's Awards, Attorney General Awards, and the Service to American Medal for their work in the Lackawanna 6 international terrorism case. Currently, Peter Ahern operates Ahern Consulting Group in the Washington, D.C. area, providing executive consulting and strategic business development for companies supporting federal, state, local, and international law enforcement agencies and the intelligence community. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. It is actually a coincidence that I was able to interview Peter Ahern's just after I had interviewed Ken Williams about the Phoenix memo. And it's really fascinating to hear about the different reactions that headquarters had regarding the field offices and terrorism cases before and after 9-11. But before we get to that interview, I have a few things that I want to tell you about. Again, I want to remind you that FBI Retired Case File Review will be on Podcast Row at CrimeCon, the world's largest true crime convention conference in the world. It's going to be in Orlando, Florida from May 1st to May 3rd. If you're planning to go, please use the promo code FBI2020 to get 10% off your registration. There's more information about CrimeCon on the homepage of my website, jerrywilliams.com. The other thing that I need to let you know is that I'm going to be doing a, another interview on recruiting with the Philadelphia Office Applicant Coordinator, Serena Coughlin, who's just been so great to, to, to me in the show. This time, we're going to be talking about the intelligence analyst position. So many of you have asked for that. And so we're going to do that and also talk about all the other non-agent jobs available at the FBI. So I am doing a call to action. If you have questions that you would like, Special Agent Serena Coughlin and an intelligence analyst from the Philadelphia office to answer... Please submit your questions by mid-February. We'll do the interview in March, and the episode will be posted sometime in April. So get those in. The other thing that I need to let you know is that I did send out my February Reader Team email digest. I've got a lot of great stuff in there, crime fiction recommendations and my FBI film and fiction review. This time I talked about the FBI story, that classic movie. So if you don't see my reader team email in your inbox, you know what to do. Check your spam filter. 
I also want you to know I have enough beta readers for my next book, FBI Word Search Puzzles. Next month, I'll be putting a call out for people to join my book launch team, and I'll be needing a lot more people for that. But for right now, I am good to go with beta readers. So, so thank you. This podcast is about true crime. But if you're also interested in crime fiction, I want to invite you to join my reader team, where once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI, books written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast, nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You can join on my website or use the link in the description of this episode in your podcast app. I would love it if you also check out my books, my nonfiction, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And there's also my Philadelphia FBI Corruption Squad crime series. All of my books are available wherever books are sold. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Peter Ahern. Hey, Pete, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I am great. I want to tell you, I, ha- I have to give credit to one of your sons, who I believe is going through the process now. Good luck to him. Uh, he reached out and he must be so proud of you because he let me know that he thought that you would make a great guest for FBI Retired Case File Review. And uh, I think so, too. Oh, I appreciate that. And yeah, proud of him and, uh, and, and all my four boys. There's no doubt about it. Okay. I know one of them actually is an agent also. That so, uh, this has become the family business. Yeah, not with my pushing. I'm just, uh, flattered they would consider it. And, you know, great organization as, as you know, and a great career. And, uh, you know, I, I miss it. I miss it dearly. I know you do. Yeah, I certainly do. Hey, well, there's nothing wrong with pushing. I really pushed it <laughs> with my three kids and no one took me up on it. So uh, well, I oh live well. vicariously through them now. So, <laughs> anyway. Okay. Well, this is really exciting because every time I get introduced to a retired agent, I have no idea what, you know, they've done in their career, what their background is. And so, you know, when I start talking about, you know, what would you like to share on the podcast? What case? can we review? And then I learn about their background. I'm always like, oh, this is so great. And this is one of those situations because you were the SAC, the person in charge of the Buffalo office at the time of the Lackawanna 6 terrorism case. That is correct. (laughs) So that's what we're going to talk about today. I am going to let you decide where you want to start. Well, I, I, I think one of the best things is, uh, is to start is, is to thank, uh, before all of this, I had, uh, the for- good fortune of having a tremendous, tremendous team of agents, analysts, and, and professional support in Buffalo. And, and when I, I got up there in May of 2001, it was a very good office. It's one of those offices where, you know, you really can't go anywhere but down. You know, it was uh, run very well by my predecessor, Bernie Tolbert. Um, and it was just, you know, how can you raise the bar and make things, uh, you know, uh, better in an office that was great. And so showing up there in May of 2001, uh, they had been through a real major case at the time on the, the assassination of Dr. Uh, Bernard Slepian, an abortion clinic doctor by James Cop. And they were used to notoriety. The history up there also was uh, Timothy McVeigh grew up outside of Buffalo. So I didn't know if it was an issue with the weather or what the problem was. And the summer of, of May of 2001 for me was just getting used to the division uh, the personalities and everything else and, and looking to see what was going on and, uh, you know, very quiet summer. But in that summer, uh, we did have uh, uh, the beginnings of a, of a terrorism case. Uh, and, and I have to give due credit uh, to Ed Needham and uh, Dave Britton, who were the case agents on this case. I mean, they, they were the heart and soul of this. Uh, probably should be doing the podcast. I was at that higher level of having to deal with the issues that we'll be talking about on, on more of that senior level. But, uh, but it was an interesting summer. And, and, uh, you know, uh, when you talk staffing levels in your office, 
the programs, you know, drugs, organized crime, white collar, corruption. We had a terrorism group, but it was very small. And at that time, the only agent that was working in international terrorism uh, matters was, uh, was uh, Ed Needham. And uh, my staffing level for that was one. I had three for the domestic issues because of the assassination uh, of, uh, of uh, Bernard Slepian uh, in uh, 1999 or whenever that was. So you, you went with your staffing level. So terrorism prior to 9 could, could you remind us uh, yes. who, who that is? Well, Slepian was a doctor that was a porny, uh, was doing abortions in an abortion clinic. And, and uh, you know, uh, one night he was, you know, helping with dinner in his kitchen and uh, an individual uh, by the name of James Cop, a, a radical anti-abortionist, uh, assassinated him, shot him through through the window of his kitchen, you know, and then became an international fugitive for years. And, and actually just before I got to Buffalo, they, he was arrested in France. So it was a domestic terrorism issue without a doubt. And, and uh, that's why we had a staffing level that was built up because of those issues with domestic matters. In this case, it was the anti-abortion killing of Dr. Slepin, you know, so that was setting the tone of, of some major cases that were up there uh, in that summer. But I only had a staffing level of Ed Needham was my terrorism guy. You know, and, uh, you know, it was pre 9 11, obviously, and, uh, you know, the importance was there, but not like it was, obviously, that would take effect uh, in September uh, on 9 11. This was one of the cases began in the Lackawanna case uh, in that summer. And a lot of people believe that this started because of some, you know, tip from the agency or something like that. But honestly, the, the thing about this case is it started with an anonymous letter that came to the office and ended up in the hands of Ed Needham. And it was the start of this investigation uh, in its infancy, looking at the allegations. And I believe it was about a 12 page letter that started with the person saying, I am an American citizen. You know, I, I fear for my life if this information gets out. But he basically laid out the fact that there were individuals uh, in uh, in Buffalo, in Lackawanna, that were being recruited by individuals that were tied to Al Qaeda. You know, with this, this organization that everybody kind of knew about was Al Qaeda. And we opened an investigation, a terrorism investigation, just kind of looking into whether or not the facts were true. And again, that letter was 12, 14 pages long. And then there was a lot of other information that spun off after the Lackawanna case into a drug case and things of that nature. But that was the, that was the start of this. And of course, Ed Needham being the talented agent he was, uh, you know, in, in the world of terrorism started to jump all over it. But again, the style back then was really the way you look at these things. We were trying to assess. We were trying to validate. We were trying to prove what was in the letter. Work in this case uh, methodically and slowly. Of course, the way you would work a case uh, prior to 9-11. But of course, after 9-11, that type of investigation changed to uh, what we'll be talking about. But that was... I could only imagine. Hey, uh, That's how it stood up. That's how it started in that summer. Well, you did share with me... uh, couple of pages from that letter. Can mm-hmm. I put that on uh, my website in the show notes? Sure. Okay, great. So I'll have that there for uh, anyone who wants to look at a couple of uh, pages from that letter. Very fascinating. Very interesting. Yeah, it was just redacted, obviously, but, you know, because of some of the stuff. And uh, I remember when I uh, retired, believe it or not, through fast forwarding, I, I, they asked me, you know, some things that would have been great if they had happened. And one thing I said, my I would have loved for that person to come forward. That person said in that letter that, you know, if something is done, I will come forward. But that person never has. Um, to my knowledge, we don't know who it was. Um, but again, that, that's that's kind of how. So it was an anonymous letter that came in, basically. And uh, you know, what's there is just nothing classified. It's just basic redacted uh, uh, versions of that uh, of that letter. But that's how this started. Uh, you know, nobody went crazy. I mean, you know, we, we, we looked at it, the allegations that these people had gone overseas and, and, and some things were done as follow up, uh, you know, of, of the, uh, the individuals that went over in the first wave of people that were going over to the camps. Ostensibly, you know, they said they were going over for religious, uh, training. If you start to follow this, and that was their reason for going over there. But what was really important, I think, in this case too, in that summer was the recruiting that was going on. You know, we had a lot of discussion. You know, uh, post 9-11 on the radicalization issue, you know, and even to this day, you still hear about it. But uh, but back then, it was the question of how did these people get recruited? Their recruitment was being done by um, an individual by the name of Kamal Derwish. And, and Derwish was a interesting, uh, you know, uh, person. You know, he was uh, born in Buffalo uh, around 1973. You have to think of, of Buffalo and Lackawanna as a, as a suburb. And historically, uh, with the immigration uh, and and the the 
Rust Belt area of what Buffalo was. That area of Lackawanna was home to Bethlehem Steel. Uh, a lot of immigrants in Buffalo. Buffalo was born on immigrants as much of this nation was. But there was a fair amount of Yemenis that lived in that Lackawanna area that had immigrated into the United States over the years and it worked. Um, you know, blue collar type jobs and things of that nature. I think second only to Detroit, I may be wrong, you know, with the depth of the Yemeni community. But Kamel Derwish was the, was what we call the recruiter. All right. He was the individual that, that had made trips, had been from Buffalo and got to know, uh, the key individuals in here. And, and if you had pictures of them, you put them on the website to go through all the names. But, uh, yeah, I'll do know, that. We could talk about it. But K- K- Kamal Derwish was the key figure in the recruiting. And having known these individuals and, and again, his history, he had been overseas. Uh, there were some allegations. I think it's true. I think, you know, Ed Needham would know more about this, but he had done and, and claimed that he had did, uh, done some fighting in, in Bosnia back in the, in the nineties and in that time. And, uh, uh, he was, uh, kind of a seasoned, so he says, combat veteran, but coming back, his whole purpose was to see and recruit people in the United States that could become jihadist fighters and, and travel overseas. So that was going on for quite a while inside that Lackawanna, Buffalo, Yemeni Muslim community at the time. Uh, and a lot of this was being done not out in the open. It was uh, kind of that, that basement recruiting that was going on. And was the, was the office yeah. aware at all that uh, people were being recruited to go back and, and get this type of training? No. No, I don't think so. There was a lot of discussion going on. There was one, one, uh, uh, one of the imams there that I recall. And again, I, I, again, at the level I was at, but I do recall discussions about one that was uh, doing some preaching in the, in the, uh, in the Lackawanna mosque that was getting a little bit, oh, shall we say, uh, you know, radical discussions going on. And he eventually, from what I understand, moved over to Germany. But that's the kind of information we had. There was, uh, and, and there was no tolerance for that, I think, in the community. I mean, the Yemeni community there, the, the Muslim community, I had learned uh, after 9-11, uh, it was a tremendous community. The, the, the people, the, the assistance that they gave, um, you know, after 9-11 and, and especially after this case, uh, you know, they were beaten up pretty bad when you think about it, you know, uh, uh, after 9-11 and then when this case broke in September of 2002. You know, but there was some discussion going on about some radical type talk, but nothing that was raising to a level of let's let's begin a you know a full field or anything like that, a full investigation. So at this that, at them, yeah. So when this letter came in, this was before nine eleven. Yes. What was the what was the take in the office? Um, did you take it seriously <laughs> immediately? No, not I, well. Yeah, it was taken seriously, but it wasn't raising to that level of we, we've got concern that we had bomb throwing terrorists here. Okay, and and as you start to see what happens after nine eleven, you know it's, it's it's kind of interesting. But that summer, uh, a couple things from my level, uh, I, I remember um, I went to the way we worked terrorism back then because again we didn't have a squad, we didn't have a JTTF, you know, and and that's that's an important part of what we'll, we'll discuss here. So that summer, and again, I, I had just gotten up there, and, and I'm looking, how can I improve things or whatever? And, and we we ran our cases in terrorism, and our, our coordination was at a a uh, working group level, okay? It wasn't formal from the standpoint of a JTTF. So I remember going to the first meetings of that, and actually, we got May, I think it was in June. We were under inspection probably in June. I had just gotten there. So in July, I remember going to a task force meeting. You know, just, you know, not, I'm sorry, not task force, but a working group and could immigration you, could, was there. Yeah, I was going to say, could yeah. you explain yep. what a working group It is? was organizations, uh, more federal, not, not even state local, you know, state police might have had some people there, but it was pretty federal. If you recall too, immigration was separate from customs. So you had customs there, you had immigration there, you had the FBI was there, you had the U.S. attorney's office. And once a month, they would talk about, you know, what they're doing and things that were going on. Uh, of course, in this case, I don't think, you know, was was talked about it was an active investigation but just in general we were, i was getting to know the people but I, I i was given a ride home by the head of immigration mike mclaughlin at the time and he mentions to me he goes you know pd said we ought to start a jttf you know he said what would you think about that he said i believe i could get some more people and of course you know me I, i'm i'm looking at how can i make things better maybe build an empire here <laughs> So long story short on that, uh, I get back to the office, talk to the ASAC at the time, an uh, individual named Stan Borgia, bring in Ed Needham, and we talked about this. And I said, why don't we write up a request to headquarters to stand up at a JTTF? 
<laughs> a little prophetic, you might say. Yeah, uh, thank that goodness. Standpoint. That was yeah. July of 2001. All right, so, so, so I yeah, have to stop. And that's because, how we were doing that, but go ahead. Yeah, I have to stop sure. uh, and make sure everybody knows that sure. a JTTF is a Joint Terrorism Task Force. Yeah. And I take it before 9-11, there were some, but it sounds like not all offices uh, had right. them. All of our offices have them, yeah. have them now, but uh, yep. why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because, you know, sure. my audience is so diverse. We've got people that are... <laughs> are true crime aficionados, and they know everything about the FBI. We have actually former and current FBI agents who listen. And then we just have people who just find this interesting. Sure. So we had to make sure that we uh, define some of our acronyms, because, you know, in the FBI, we have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Uh, but, yes, that is joint terror. And, and just very briefly, too, the history of it, from my knowledge. And, again, I, I don't want anybody to think I know everything and I'm 100% accurate. I'm pretty close. But the, the Joint Terrorism Task Forces, and I remember this is a fairly new agent, uh, you know, when it happened. And uh, the first uh, JTTF, I believe, started in New York City. And it was a direct result of the Nyack bank robbery, uh, armored car robbery in Nyack, New York. Uh, I want to say, time may be off, I want to say maybe 79 uh, 80, it was, it was done, uh, you know, uh, by radical, uh, domestic, uh, terrorism group, the Black Panthers, Joanne Chesimard, that was believed to be in there, who was a now a fugitive, but kind of a terrorist link, but domestically and, and killed two, two guards, police officers. But because of that, the decision was made. It made sense. We've got to work with NYPD, FBI, and they started the very first, uh, um, my understanding, and, and I'm sure people will correct me if I'm wrong, but started with that. Uh, was the very first Joint Terrorism Task Force was out of New York. And then when we applied for it in July, early August of 2001, I believe there were probably 23, uh, 24 Joint Terrorism Task Forces operating, you know, in the FBI that were joint. And, and we'll talk more about this, uh, especially with this case uh, and post 9-11. And uh, so those were kind of enigmas out there and entities. And so we decided we, we wanted to try to ask for one. So, you know, we started the paper, and the paper was submitted in early August, requesting the establishment of a joint terrorism task force uh, in uh, the Buffalo Division, and that was it. We put it through, and, uh, and and I'll be honest with you too, I wasn't that aware how deeply uh, I wasn't very deep on this investigation at all in that summer. You know, I mean, of course, Ed Needham was in the squad that worked part of it, but he was the only one, and we, we were aware of it, but nothing that was focusing major on my radar. You know, had some other issues. And again, this is pre-9-11. Right. And you had just gotten there, really. Yep. Hey, and could that we, all changed. Yeah. Could we take a, just sure. a moment to talk about what was in the letter? What were the allegations or information provided? Uh, is this a good time to do that? It is. Um, and, and basically, uh, again, generally speaking, uh, there was, uh, I think it was about 12 pages. And we, we won't talk about a lot of the other stuff because there were allegations, too, that these individuals, not just the ones that went over to the camps, uh, these individuals were also involved in, you know, drug activity and, and minor crime. And actually, that was part of the recruitment effort by Kamal Derwish that summer. Actually, it was spring in the winter and spring of 2001, where he was challenging some of these kids saying, you've lost your faith, you've lost your, you know, your religion, uh, you've married outside the Muslim race. There were a lot of things he was alleging and trying to get these individuals he was trying to recruit to come back to their religion. And part of that was to do that, you should travel overseas and you should go to, you know, without going and say, go to a terrorist camp. But that's what this was all about in that summer, you know, working on the youth, trying, that's part of the recruitment get them to feel that they've lost their religion and then come back to it. And their best way was let's plan a trip and let's go overseas. So that was in the letter of that type of information. You know, it was these individuals, how they were being recruited. They went over to the camps. Those were the allegations being made that they went over, even things like they had met with Osama bin Laden in a meeting, which they did while they were at those camps. And those allegations were in the letter that led for us to, you know, the, the Bureau to start to, to validate some of this. In particular, uh, a good example, a good time of this, it was in the letter. But as the investigation was going on, you know, we had, the New York office did on the return of these people that came back, were stopped on their inbound, and they were interviewed about their trip. And again, this wasn't raising to that level of, you know, uh, everybody's hair's on fire after 9-11. This was a good practice, uh, good investigative tools. And actually, we now do more of that 
uh, the way we should have been doing this, in my opinion, to try to talk to people, look at people, and maybe turn them, make them informants. Or, you know, that was kind of the plan. Let's validate the letter. And then sure enough, you know, they came back and they were interviewed. And of course, they lied about it. You know, oh, yeah, we just went over visiting relatives, went over with a, a church group, uh, 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 Jamaat al Tabliq which was their, uh, a, a religious organization of Muslims. And they were saying, if anybody asks you, you're going over that summer with that group. And it's a religious you know, training thing. And then they diverted while they were there and went to the camps. That stuff was in the letter, you know, basically. So we're trying to validate it here and trying to build a case. Uh, it was an intelligence case at first. And, you know, and you've got to remember, too, now, this is pre-9-11. This is pre-Patriot Act which we'll might talk about a little later where, you know, we're doing a, an intelligence collection kind of thing going on, but is there a criminal case? And back then before nine 11, and um, you may have had people talk about uh, the Patriot act and, and everything that happened uh, and why that was there to allow investigators to share information. But we, we were doing those steps in that summer of uh, 2001 to do the validation of what was in the letter. So those are the type of things, uh, Jerry, that were in the letter in addition to some other stuff, which might be good for another show sometime, but followed up a year later on the drug stuff. But that's how it was setting up. And and the summer was going on. Uh, we didn't have any information uh, that we knew, that anyone knew that there was something coming. But what was really interesting, in August of 2001, I went down to headquarters uh, for a meeting, and, and I'll never forget this. Um, you know, and I was in the hallway and I ran into the deputy director at the time of the FBI, a tremendous, tremendous individual, Tom Picard. And I says, Hey, Tom, you know, how's it going? This and that. We talked and, and you could see on his face there was worried. And he, he said to me, he goes, Yeah, he said, I'm telling you, he said, things are a little uh, tough right now. He says, we just have a belief that there's something going on, you know, and he's telling me this. I'm like, Oh, that's pretty interesting. And at the time I'm not that deep on the case. Uh, <laughs> that we're working up there. And, you know, the clock goes two weeks later after I'm down at headquarters, two, two and a half weeks uh, when 9-11 happened. And that's what he was talking about. And, and that's another show, another story about all that information. The guest you had, the uh, you know, from the Phoenix Division, all of that type of stuff. How our case was playing into that was not a major, major piece. But now in hindsight, you look back and say, geez, you know, if we had maybe been more aggressive because in that summer when they were at the camps in that April, May time frame, when they met with bin Laden, bin Laden had indicated, you know, that, you know, there were things going on and there will be, as uh, I think in some of the interviews, that there will be things on the scale, if not bigger than the attack on the USS Cole, uh, which was a, a, an attack that was done uh I think what 2000 maybe I, timing I can't remember the the time frame but all that links to Al Qaeda to Bin Laden so those were the things going on in that summer that fear that we could see something was going on of course I'm kind of like what the hell's he talking about I had no idea and then 9/11 happened so it's a good segue into that part because wow, everything yeah. changed in this case after that. I can only imagine <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I you can lived only, it. you were there yeah, I lived no, it too no, yeah. yeah every everybody was a part of all of this activity, just, you know, just yeah. trying to learn as much as possible in as short a time as possible. So, yeah. so let, let me ask you this. Sure. You're watching TV. Someone tells you, you know, to, to turn on the TV and you're watching it. Do you immediately think about that letter and mm. the investigation that was going on in Buffalo at that time? No, Jerry, I got to be honest with you. I, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, I was clueless, okay? Only because it, at that level, I had not deep dived the case. And, but let me tell you then what happens, because again, I didn't fall off a turnip truck. <laughs> well, let me, let me, let me, let me so, just say this real yeah. quick. Mm -hmm. um, for those people, again, because I like to make sure that we don't leave anybody in the dark. You have a case agent who's yes. working on a squad. Then you have a squad supervisor. Mm -hmm. Then that squad supervisor reports to an ASAC, an assistant special agent in charge. And then you have the special agent in charge of a uh, small, medium size, you mm -hmm. know, and, and some of the larger offices who has several ASACs that report to him. And so it is impossible for the SAC to have a detailed handle on every case in their division. Right. Everybody recognizes that. Yeah. I mean, and I, I worked fraud cases and, and I, I think I only had one case that I know 
that the SAC was briefed on, you know, almost on a daily, at least weekly basis, because it was a, a you know, a major case in the Philadelphia area. But right. that, I just want to set that scene as you continue. Sure. You know, I'm not up on the day to day things, but you know, one, one thing I had initiated when I got up there that uh, they used to have, you know, monthly squad me where everybody comes in that, that managers and they, you know, go around the table, what's going on and admin things that need to be done or everything else. And, and so I was aware we had an investigation that was going on, but not the depth of it, but it, it changes. And then, it, like I said, the light bulb <laughs> didn't have to go on, you know, in a week, it went pretty quick after that morning of 9 11 how that all transpired. But when you're talking about this case, one of the very first things I did that day, just dealing with everything, getting back to the office, finding everybody, mobile command posts. I mean, we were in crisis mode, not knowing what was going on. But one of the first things I did was I could be, you know, all the supervisors. And the one thing I wanted to know, and I told the ASAC, I said, I want to know what are terrorism cases? What do we have? How many? Because I knew what was coming. You know, and it's like everybody else. We knew this has changed everything. So I needed to know what do I have in my terrorism program? You know, besides, yeah, we had a case with a letter and we were looking at it. What else do I have? Do I have 10 cases? You know, do, what, what's that, uh, you know, from that standpoint of program management, I needed to know right away in case somebody asked me, you know, and, uh, that's what it was like. But, uh, that's when I really jumped into it when they briefed me deeper on it. And I said, we need to get all over this now. You know, you could see this coming, and I'm, I'm glad we did in those early days. With everything else that was going on, you know, all the leads from the bombing, I mean, you, you remember that. You were in the command posts, uh, and for the people listening to this, it was, you know, people would think that the uh, the FBI knows everything, you know. But uh, I call that the mystique of the FBI, and I'd rather think people and the bad guys think we know everything. But if you really knew the reality of it, yeah, you, you don't know everything. I was getting intelligence and, like everybody else. And it's else. impossible. It's yeah. impossible to know everything. Sure. I was getting intelligence of what's going on, uh, you know, on the television, like everybody else. Uh, you know, but we moved quickly, you know, in the bureau to organize that and, uh, and, and the way that that started. But with this case, you know, without getting into these details of what it was like at 9-11 in that office, um, that day I got the briefing and it, 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 you know, I kind of knew that we had to uh, get, get into this. But the other factor that is important for people to realize, too, especially with the FBI, as we went into terrorism, there wasn't a staffing level of agents working terrorism like there are today, nor after 9-11. And again, I told you, I only had Ed Needham, one agent. Um, I right away gave him another agent, uh, it was Dave Britton, to get this thing organized and, and, and to look at my terrorism program. But I didn't have the agents. The agents were either working organized crime and drugs, which was mostly the priority, or white collar, as you know. And But we had to take that assessment. But one thing I had to do was get the manpower working just to handle the enormity of the and the scale of the 9-11 investigation with the bombings and the leads. And we were on a border, and I wasn't worried about people coming in. My concern were people leaving. You know, who's leaving? The rat's leaving a sinking ship, so to speak. We had all of that going on, but we had to address this case. And actually, most of my agents that came and became terrorism agents, like so many more in the FBI, came out of my organized crime and drug program. I shifted them right over, uh, and they were used to these sophisticated techniques of wiretaps and re requests and affidavits and how you get to a certain point. So that shift went over to a terrorism squad that I didn't even have. You know, uh, I just had one agent. We didn't have a squad of people working terrorism. That, that squad at the time, I can't even remember where they were assigned, might have been assigned, I think, to the counterintelligence squad, but just one agent. And it just blew up after that. And this case went right to the top of the chart of we've got to address this in July, in, in September 2001 and get a handle on what we have and really prioritize it and, and see where we could go. And, and that's how it started and got the attention. Now, when you talk about headquarters, they really were not tuned into this case at, at all, nor, nor should they. They had other issues. But the months went on with this case, with that investigation going on. I would be asking about it. How is it proceeding? We were, we were doing the investigations. We were starting to look at how to use some more sophisticated techniques. We were really, most importantly, trying to validate the individuals and whether or not they had any ties, because this is post 9-11. To Al Qaeda, do we have anything? First place we went to, obviously, was to the agency. You know, and without getting into details, because there's nothing secret I'm giving up here. But we we did it. Gave them all the names and everything else in September 
probably even before that, I believe, and I think of what Ed Needham had told me that, you know, we did, and all they did was a name check. Okay. And none, zero, none of the individual, uh, individuals at the time, there were nine. You know, they called it the Lackawanna Six, but it was really, you know, it was nine when you had a Derwish, who was the recruiter, another friend of his, Juma El Dasari, which came to Buffalo to help with the recruiting to get people, you know, to come over to uh, Afghanistan and, and get into that world of becoming uh, jihadists and being trained and to go over there. And uh, that was the uh, attitude of the individuals that went. They went over to see what, what this was going to be like. But yeah. that, but that's what, what they were doing. So there were really nine people in this whole plot that, uh, that went over. And when they went over to those camps, they flew into Pakistan and they did secure to us routes through hotels that were known that we found out post investigation after the uh, case was um, made public, you know, and how they got there and the interviews of these individuals we'll talk about later and what they said and who they met. And basically, I, I remember u- using this and, and making it kind of akin to whether or not it was like TV show Survivor. You know, it's like I remember saying that. I said, why do these guys, do they think they're going to the island to see who gets thrown off? I mean, you know, what were they thinking? I mean, we just couldn't believe as this case really started going, what were they thinking? And do you think that they knew what, where they were going and what they were going to do? I don't believe they did. I mean, I think they knew they were going over, but I think what happened, and I think the interviews, the the nice part about this this case, uh, you know, we're talking about what it led up to. It's the post, the uh, you know, investigative stuff, because again, you know, let's fast forward because I think it's important that people understand we know all of this because everybody cooperated after they were charged and they pled guilty. And so the best part about this was the, it, 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 sadly though, it was intelligence that wasn't what we would call active uh, intelligence where you can act on it. It was more historical of, of what happened and it, it gave law enforcement and the intelligence community the ability to understand the recruiting and how this stuff could happen. But to answer your question, I, I don't think they knew the depth of what it was. And actually, from interviews, we realized a couple of them left early. They left the camps early. They were afraid. You know, they got into this. They were like, you know, what the hell are we doing? You know, but again, we found this out later. You know, you got to remember 9-11, you're looking at a case like this and you're saying, okay, what do we have here? I mean, do I have uh, the term we use? Do I have bomb throwers? You know, that's what this thing started as. You know, we didn't know how deep it was. I can only comment on the fact they left, they were afraid, based on uh, the the post-interviews after the case was all over. But at the time, especially after 9-11, you can imagine, you know, what we're thinking here as this is going on. But it was a pretty quiet period of time with this investigation between September of 2001 when we're ramping this thing up, and then, of course, the middle of September, I believe it or not, gee, there's a surprise. I, I re- received one of the first JTTFs. Uh, we were given the funding and said, do it, you know, and that was because we already had our memo in. <laughs> so timing was great, and we were ramping that up. You know, uh, I had a staffing level of FBI agents in the Western New York office out of Buffalo of, of 86 when I got there. W- when I left in 2005, 2006, I had 119. Oh wow, that's a, a big increase in staffing yeah, level. Lot, yeah. So who, so anyway, who was but, on who was on your Buffalo JTTF? Interesting. You know, when you when you look at that after nine eleven, and I think everybody can understand this. I mean, you know, law enforcement agencies were beating down the door. You know, um, wanting to help. I mean, uh, the mood of the country. Uh, you know, um, the, the tragedies uh, that that pendulum swung from the right all the way over to what can be done. And uh, I had retired agents volunteering to come in and help, you know, just dealing with the enormity of the investigation uh, and the leads that followed. And in the meantime, we had this, this case, but when we stood up the JTTF in 2001, it wasn't really hard (laughs) to get law enforcement agencies to volunteer. You know, they wanted to be part of this, but there were their own internal politics. Uh, you know, for example, you would have a chief of police of Amherst, who was one of the one of the best I ever worked with up there, was committing right away. I will give you two full time people right away. Full time. They're yours. I had some saying, well, we don't want to be full time, but we want to be part of it. We want to know what's going on. It was I, it, we basically said, look, you're either into this 100 percent. You know, or you can get the briefings when we have our, 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 our coordinating meetings and things like that. But we needed help. But uh, at the time, uh, I think when RJTTF was stood up in this case, give or take, we had 22 different agencies, state, local, federal working 
inside the office uh, that were part of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And to me, it was just amazing. Now, you got to remember, too, that these people, before they could work, they had to go through significant background checks. They had to be, uh, you know, vetted, uh, just like, uh, you know, most FBI, you know, FBI agents and, and analysts and professional support. We had to get them right on quickly. Um, and uh, we put together a great team of individuals um, that were trained. I remember sitting through the case when it really took off in May of 2002, when it really, and we, we've got to get to that part, they would walk in giving me paperwork that I had to sign, you know, FISA applications, which is for an intelligent, uh, uh, the Surveillance Act for uh, what was going on to do the, the, the work we did on our case. They knew the paper. They would come in. You could walk into that Joint Terrorism Task Force. You couldn't tell an FBI agent from an ATF agent from a Sheriff's Department of Niagara Falls you know, which were all members of that. So that was the membership on and off throughout the period of this case and, and remained uh, until I left. You know, there was uh, there was a big commitment of, of people. And the best part about that was with all of this, when the case finally ended, and again, I apologize to jump forward, this case never leaked to anybody, never leaked to the media, uh, and never leaked to anyone when we brought this case down. And that's a testament to the people that work the case to the dedication and that's a joint tourism task force and that's the way it should be right. sharing everything and it was uh it was tremendous so yeah. that, um, but anyway that, that was that's that the was, way it should work it is and it still does to this day you know on a side note you don't see you know there's not as much the participation has dropped off because you know in reality it's been what you know 18 19 years um you know my math since 9 11 and you know that that pendulum has swung back a little bit and there are other issues of dealing with drugs violence and everything else and but but the fbi and other agencies we pretty much have this down on how we work things uh, but but again i digress on that but but after 9 11 Man, there was no patience for anything, and that's important to understand with how this case took off. And and, and let's go to that through the months that go by. And the key change in this in this uh, investigation took off in May. I want to say it was May of two thousand and two. You know, uh, we're we're doing things. We're aware of this. We're we're validating. We're watching. We're doing whatever we can. And we were running names again. And there was a analyst. I forget her name. And uh, I believe, I, you know, she was one of the recipients of the director's award on this case. But we get a phone call Ed gets a phone call and there's an FBI agent working at the agency. And she's the one that connected the dots that uh, my recollection, I may be wrong here, but I think she connected Camille Derwish uh, to associations with members of Al Qaeda. You know, and when we got that, it was, oh, well. I won't say it, but you know what I'm saying. Oh my gosh, gee, <laughs> this, <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> is, this is going to be okay. Here we go, and uh, you know, and it was really starting to, you know, now we're validated that we have the card carrying members of Al Qaeda that came to Buffalo. One is from Buffalo, uh, and what made this case different from so many more that have come to this day, especially during that time frame. If you had a case on anybody and they were from overseas and they were not citizens. We didn't do investigations. I mean, Jerry, you remember those days too. You know, they, there were material witness warrants and you grab these people and you send them out of the country. Okay. You didn't have time to do what we do as, as investigators to work that case to maybe flip them. I mean, I thought what we were hoping to do at the time, and, and I, I know we were, I should say we thought it was how can we maybe get one or two of these people and get enough on them to flip them and to roll them with the question of, so, um, would you go back to the camps, you know, and, and put them in play uh, with our partner at the time, you know, w which would be the CIA. I mean, that, that's how you want to do this. You want to keep this thing going. And, you know, we were hoping to find Derwish come back to the United States because he was overseas. You know, we were playing the long game on this until May of 2002 when this connection came on. And it just went from, yeah, we're working the case to now headquarters. <laughs> wanting to start to interject themselves somewhat in the case. But that was the big turning point where we really uh, realized that we've got ourselves, you know, a problem. And remember at the time too, we still didn't know, are these sleepers? Are they going to be activated? Are they going to be bomb throwers? Are they going to, we, we needed to do that and to, and to find that out. So before May, are you saying that you were able to work the case without a lot of, input or yes. oversight by headquarters yes. yes yeah which was the best way <laughs> yeah 
I think a lot of people thought, you know, after, you know, headquarters was running everything in those early days, you know, and, and I think it was to a point, but I think they were so busy that I, I didn't feel there was that kind of, they were telling me what to do or, you know, they, they tried, but that's another story. But I think, you know, they realized we knew what we were doing come May and June. And those were, those were key moments, uh, you know, for the investigation that put it on, on the, uh, on the radar. And I also remember too, trying to go down, uh, and I went to headquarters to do briefings, trying to get the attention of some people. It was, it was, it was crazy times down there. And, uh, I tell the story actually, uh, very, still very close to, uh, Dale Watson, who was the assistant director, I think at the time of terrorism or deputy assistant director. And I was going down there in early June to brief him because I wanted to tell him, you know, we had a tiger by the tail is what we had. And we were supposed to meet, but he was just, you can imagine, he's constantly busy. So I never had the meeting. And I flew back to Buffalo. And the next day, I get a call from Dale. And he says to me, he goes, Pete, he said, I just got a briefing this morning. He said, on a case you have up there. <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, Dale. He goes, is that the case you wanted to talk to me about yesterday? I said, yes, it is. He goes, boy, he says, you've got the most important case of the FBI right now. I said, well, I kind of thought it was important, Dale, but not that, you know, much more going on. And that's when it really started. You know, we were ramping up. I was getting a lot of help from headquarters, uh, helping process the paperwork and, and doing uh, the investigative techniques we did, you know, with uh, using court ordered wiretapping and things of that nature, uh, the emails and all of that stuff. All of that was spinning in June, it really started to ramp up. Um, around the clock surveillances were starting to be instituted, and that was crazy, you know, at the time, trying to deal with that. And, and that what were you seeing? I'm, I'm very curious as yeah, to what you were seeing during the, the surveillances. Yeah, not a lot, because I, I've got to tell you, I mean, they, you know, they were, I think they were pretty much aware. Um, you know, the, the key individual at that time uh, uh, of the group was a guy named Salim al Wan. Salim was an interesting person, and actually, uh, you know, Ed Needham had talked to Salim without telling him what we knew. I mean, you know, but Salim, and we found this out later, was extremely nervous in guiding these people, you know, tell him, destroy your passports. You know, I mean, he was, he was even though showing somewhat kind of being cooperative, but not knowing that we knew about what he had done. It was interesting times back then. Um, uh, but we were watching, you know, just typical surveillance. Who are they meeting with? What are they doing? You know, that type of stuff. Uh, and again, worrying at the time that, that these people could be bomb throwers, you know, and we had a couple interesting things that would come up at the time where at one time they were talking about propane tanks, you know, <laughs> and it turned out we didn't know if it was one of our sources being tested or whatever, but it turned out to be nothing. But, but, but this case now, you got to remember that summer from May and June was being watched and worked on jointly with, uh, with, uh, the, the uh, terrorism, uh, division down there with the supervisors and everything we were very helpful in, in giving us the manpower and authorizing, uh, getting authorization to do the things we needed to do, you know, but it was also drawing the scrutiny of the director <laughs> starting in. June, July, and of course, you know, wanting to know what's going on. And, and actually, this case then started to get briefed to the president um, on a pretty daily basis, uh, weekly then, too, of course. And that's where the pressure started to come of when are you going to take these individuals down? You know, there was no no patience to run a long term game to figure out what was going on. Let's do the collection. Can we get Derwish to come back from overseas where we can put him in position to maybe arrest him? And the scrutiny started then. You know, my job was hopefully to keep that scrutiny and that pressure off of the of the team that was doing their job, and we were able to do that. That summer was was a lot of pressure. And everything that was being done was being read down by analysts and supervisors and was going to the director and eventually to the president. And there's some interesting things that happened that kind of funny we'll talk about here in a second. I was wondering, and, you know, of course, I'm a, an agent. Skepticism is, is part of our uh, DNA. How much of this was to have a win, to be able to show that the FBI that the intelligence community, you know, that the administration, that they were doing active stuff. And how much of it was, are you ready? Is this case at a level where we're ready to take the next move? I think, I think, uh, you know, when you talk from the FBI standpoint, it was not that. 
I think when you go outside of politics of that, when you get into the, some of these things that were, were done with the briefings of the president pushed by the agency, um, the, the bureau, it was not, uh, we need a win. The, the bureau's concern was we have to eliminate a potential threat. And I felt that was always the, the, the reason and the, and the mission. And I could understand that. Uh, I could also understand why there was no, I don't want to call tolerance, but you know, it was, we have to do this and we have to make sure, you know, the, the threats eliminated and we have to do it and do it right. And the reason that this case went on longer than it normally did was these were United States citizens. And that's something we haven't mentioned yet. You know, I, I alluded to that when we had people that were in the United States that were not citizens, if there was any indication they were involved in something, they were asked to leave the country. You couldn't ask these people to leave the country. And that was part of the frustration, I think, that people in Washington had was, well, it's easy. Let's just grab them and throw them out of the country. Then we don't have the problem if there is a problem. You know, I remember those discussions in that summer saying, you know, what made this case what it was, the first investigation we had where we had U.S. citizens, because remember, every one of these people, uh, I believe there were a few exceptions, but they were U.S. citizens. They were born in New York, in the state. Um, you know, I look at the group, there two were born in Yemen, but they were naturalized. The rest of them were born in Lackawanna. So you had U.S. citizens. And based on that, you had to do everything. You know, they had the protections of the Constitution. Yeah, let me, ask, let me ask a question for the listeners, because I'm sure, sure. there are people mm-hmm. out there who want me to ask this question. And that is, is it illegal for an American citizen to go to another a foreign country mm-hmm. and participate in a training <laughs> camp, a terrorist training camp? Interesting. And the question was asked many a times. And, uh, you know, and, and I think the best way to say it is when you look at the charges that were eventually uh, leveled against these individuals, they were not charged with acts of terrorism. You know, that was the whole idea here of, of preventing an act. But what they were charged with, and this is the answer to your question, it was illegal to provide material support. OK, and in this case, what's material support? Well, they raised money. They used money to go overseas, to go to a camp that was run by a terrorist organization. And those were the charges in the fact that they were providing material support in the aid of terrorism by going to those camps. They did go through training. Okay. They did shoot guns. They did everything, you know, and then, then they, they, they got cold feet and they came back and realized what they had done. Um, but again, they hid it. They lied about it and things of that nature. But the charges were, it is illegal to provide material support. And now that, that what everybody gets charged with in the last 10 years have been, uh, material support to ISIS. In this case, it was material support to a known organization, a terrorism organization. In this case, it was Al Qaeda. Those were the charges to answer the question. Yes, that is illegal to do and to go over and to do that. And uh, in addition to a lot of other things like, you know, providing false statements. Uh, but the main charges were providing material support and that material support was themselves to go over there as well as what they took with them, you know, uh, money, some kind of, you know, personal items that they were asked to bring with them to give to the people in the camp. Part of that overt act was to travel to a a camp run by terrorists. Interesting, pretty much it. So, but it was on the radar of everybody, and uh, and and all our information was being looked at. The problem we ran into a couple times uh, in that summer were the interpretations of information that we had that were being interpreted by people in Washington that were not talking to us to validate that. You know, when the FBI does what we do. Uh, we're used to taking cases to criminal court. So the information we develop in any investigation, you want it validated. You know, you want to prove it uh, because you can't just say, well, they told me they went to a camp. We had to prove all of that. That's what you do because eventually this could end up in, in a trial, you know, uh, in the long run. The intelligence community has a different standard, you know, and some of the information they were looking at, they were making interpretations. And, and I say this because I, I can talk about it, but it was funny, but, you know, I got a call one morning in that summer. And things were, you know, had round the clock surveillances. I mean, nothing, you know, we're doing what we have to do, but we're trying to find a way that we can take these individuals out legally uh, on some kind of criminal charge. So I get a phone call one morning and it was from the uh, assistant director at the time was Pat uh, DeMiro. You know, and Pat called me and he said, Pete, and he was upset. I mean, you know, there was issues. He said, have you read this report by our sister agency? (laughs) 
I said, what report? You know, and he, he told me, and I guess there was some information that had been passed that they were looking at, at the CIA, where they talk uh, some of the discussion by these individuals that were using the term wedding. And it was kind of interesting. Historically, uh, an analyst from the agency had determined that in the early 90s, the term wedding was used in communications overseas to signal a terrorist attack. Because, again, they're not going to say it's a terrorist attack. You know, uh, we're going to have a wedding. We're going to bring a wedding. But anyway, the interpretation was because they used this term, they were talking about it. The individuals, you know, uh, from this were talking about a wedding, that they're talking about a terrorist event, that something's going to happen. <laughs> and it got briefed to the president uh, by uh, the director of the CIA and our director, Director Mueller, happened to be sitting in the room. And you can understand when that's being briefed and he doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so you can imagine the phone call I received. Yeah, and, and I think I know where this story is headed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, Pat, I don't know what you're talking about. And because, again, nobody showed us, you know, we're in the field. This is all being run out of headquarters, you know, part of some of the issues. But, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, I put the phone down and, you know, I call in the case agents. I said, let me get back to you, you know, Pat, and I'll find out. And <clears throat> they briefed me and they said, boss, he said, one of the subjects is getting married. <laughs> I said, What? He goes, yeah. He says, it's a wedding. I went, oh, my God. You know, pick up the phone call, Pat. Sometimes a wedding <laughs> is really a wedding. a wedding. It goes, Jerry, to the issue of validation. You know, if somebody had called and said, hey, look, we're, we, we want to write this, you know, analysis. Can we validate the information? We said, no, it's a wedding. And it would have never happened. And, oh, you can imagine that. And he says, Pete, he says, I got to go. I got to hang up the phone. I got to get to the director. Because, you know, I was already packing my bags. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting ready to get removed based on the fact that I'm incompetent. You know, this is what the, the feeling is when, you know, the director comes back and, and says, find out what the hell's going on up there. But it's just an interesting story. But it was it just it, it just uh, is an example of how much was being done uh, in Washington and, and that, you know, let's manage these cases out of headquarters. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's really hard to do when you're hard. not. When you don't have access to, as they say, the boots on the ground, the sure. people who are actually, you know, looking at the case. Uh, and it goes to that question you asked me about the politics of things. And I think it was, you know, the Bureau's attitude was we can't miss this again because the belief was, you know, and, and history show that there were dots. And I hate that term of not connecting the dots. So, uh, you know, I remember, you know, they sent up a section chief, uh, you know, which was in that scheme of, of a very important person came up uh, who I knew very well, um, Andy Arena, who came in and I said, Andy, he said, uh, yeah, he said, they sent me up here. I said, what are you here for? You know, he goes, well, well, ostensibly, they wanted him to come up there to run the case, you know, and uh, he lasted about four hours and said, Pete, he says, I know you. He said, I know, uh, you know, your team. And again, he knew I had a tremendous, tremendous team of people. I can't, I can't stress that enough. You know, I, I just was lucky to sit in the chair, quite frankly. It wasn't me doing this. I, you know, I, I just kept things running and gave them whatever they needed that I could get. And Andy lasted four hours and he said, look, he said, I'm going back to tell them, you know what you're doing. You got this thing, you know, in control. And then we did. So we never really got much more pressure than a couple phone calls like that because of interpretations that were made by people that were not really deep in the investigation. So time continues through that summer. You know, we're consolidating things. We're trying to find a way to deal with this. You know, and I remember, you know, uh, uh, telling Washington, saying, look, you know, I could take these people out tomorrow. I said, I could. I said, I have what we had developed in, in not just an intelligence collection. That was that Patriot Act issue where everything comes together. You can work in intelligence, the criminal part of this. And we had these individuals for simple things, wire fraud, credit card fraud, because you have to remember, and a lot of that was in that letter. These people... And, and others were just, you know, also young kids involved in criminal activity too, you know, so that would pay a cell phone or, or, or stole a cell phone, wouldn't pay a bill. Or I said, I could take these people out tomorrow, you know, uh, on this case, but they'd be out of jail by noon. You know, we had to have a substantial case. And, and this then goes to a very critical juncture here in the case. Uh, what people have to understand too, with, while this was going on, we were not in, tight control or not uh, a briefing of our counterparts, which are the United States attorneys, the prosecutors. And so people that are listening to this, you know, it's, it's like that TV show law and order, 
we investigate the crimes, prosecutors prosecute. But after 9-11, this was an intelligence case. So U.S. attorneys, the prosecutors aren't involved in this because we're just collecting information intelligence until it comes a time that we have something that we might have to get them involved in. And it's interesting, the United States attorney at the time, his name is Mike Battle. Mike Battle was, uh, was, was fabulous, was appointed by George Bush. Um, two days after 9-11 or the next morning, I actually had my first meeting. He was a proposed candidate to be the U.S. attorney and could not believe that I was meeting with him, you know, just to get to know him the day after 9-11. You know, and I said, well, that's because, Mike, it's important. We're starting your background. He became the United States attorney. But up until the end of July of 2002, they had no idea that this case was going on because we couldn't share the information. And uh, it was then decided, we came up with this plan called, if you remember the TV show called The Weakest Link, okay, where, yep. you know, we we called this, you know, and we're sitting there saying it's like the TV show. You know, a lot of references to TV shows. I guess I needed a life. But um, The Weakest Link, I said, what we need to do now is bring in the U.S. Attorney's Office and let's see if we can maybe get them to convene grand juries. And let's find The Weakest Link here and get one of these people to roll, to cooperate. Once we get cooperation, we can make a case on material support to terrorism. Because again, we're trying to find a way. As the months are going by, we're not getting bomb throwers. We've got to do something about these individuals uh, based on the pressure coming out of Washington of we can't let these people go and, and take a risk that they might try to do something later. So I convened a meeting um, and the U.S. Attorney, Mike and I had a tremendous relationship and and uh, I would always ask him, are you going to be around this summer? You got any plans? <laughs> he knew something was up. And actually, with the Joint Terrorism Task Force, we had a prosecutor, you know, a, some uh, person, that's just a U.S. attorney. His name was Bill Hochul. And Bill would come to the meetings. We had JTTF meetings weekly. But we would never talk about this case because of the, of the nature of the investigation. It was an intelligence collection case. And, and so people that are listening, there's a difference. It's not criminal. It's it's collecting information and, you know, that you don't need a, a, a judge to sign anything. That was all done by what we call those FISA courts, those, uh, you know, uh, courts that do uh, that type of work. It's in the news now when you talk about the FBI working on uh, revamping some of the guidance on what they call the FISA. So uh, we decided that we're going to, you know, talk to the U.S. attorney to, to get him involved in this and open up the criminal side of this to put some leverage and pressure on somebody inside of the group of the Lackawanna Nine. In this case, it was the six. But the funny part of it, the prosecutor would be in those meetings and he, he would, there were some other side things going on with other agencies on movement of money, you know, uh, that customs had going and he wanted, uh, you know, more involvement by the FBI and had no clue what was going on. In fact, we're 24 seven people are working off. And actually, he was berating a couple, you know, people in the meeting. And uh, I heard one of the New York State reps, uh, you know, tremendous uh, investigator was assigned, you know, almost got up out of his chair. You know, <laughs> but he said, hey, calm down. And he left and then we would talk about the case. You know, it was interesting. So we brought in the U.S. attorney uh, into my side conference room, the U.S. attorney um, who had a clearance, the first assistant that had a clearance. These are top secret you know, clearances that you need to share information. And we brought in that prosecutor that was the head of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. You know, he was kind of the coordinator. And we laid out our plan, you know, um, and we laid out what was going on. We told them, and you should have seen their eyes just listening. You know, Mike Battle sat there, his legs crossed, you know, just listening, listening. And when I was done presenting what we were trying to do, it could be the grand jury, let's get somebody in, you know, and, and, get them to lie or whatever, and just put some pressure on them. And when I was over the presentation, it was myself, the ASAC case agents and the supervisor, and we, we made a compelling case. And he said, I'll give you anything you need to do this. And Bill Hochul, who was the head of the task force, looked at me and he said, Pete, he said, I think I need to apologize to some people <laughs> because he had no clue that we were running this, this case like this and couldn't understand why we weren't doing more in some other we didn't feel were priority matters. So wow. that led us into this plan of we're now going into August. We're going to go with this weakest link concept. We start developing the plan to do this, to try to find a way to bring criminal charges and get somebody to roll, to flip, to cooperate 
that can validate all that information about they went to the camps, met with Bin Laden, all of that type of stuff. We needed somebody to do that. And that was what the plan was. But things changed in September of 2002. We got a great break of what happened. Kind of like a novel here. You, now we should take a break now, I guess, or get a cup of coffee or use the restroom. <laughs> Is this the intermission? <laughs> yeah, right. So anyway, that, that had, so we, what happened in the early part of September 2002, we finally get a break. You know, Ed Deedham, and these are the investigators. This isn't, again, I keep saying this wasn't me. This is just a story and, you know, what I remember from the investigation. But one of the individuals had left the country. You know, uh, he was the one we talk about the wedding. <laughs> and, and he was going over to get married. Uh, I believe he was in Bahrain at the time. And one of the things that we had decided to do was we were going to conduct interviews, you know, at the time. We were getting ready for the grand jury. We were going to, you know, and, and, and believe me, with all the surveillances going on, they knew we were following them. Okay. I, I, I want to say that too. There was, it got to be no secret. It was almost like we were bumper locking, being that close to them. And, and you could hear from some of our collection things going on. They knew we were out there, but that wasn't a problem. We wanted to keep them from doing something. So the pressure was on. There was no doubt about it. So, uh, um, we do an interview. It was conducted uh, in Bahrain. The uh, assistant legal attache assigned to the embassy in Saudi Arabia made the trip to do the interview. And, of course, he gets with the Bahrainian uh, the National Police or whatever, and, and they kick the door in on this guy during his wedding night. Uh, of course, that's Bahrain. They're, they don't have to worry about certain things. They're working with the FBI when they grab him. Long story short, he flips and cooperates during his initial interview and he, wants to, he wants to get back to his wedding night <laughs> yeah he wasn't going anywhere you know i mean it was timings everything on where you are i guess and you know i don't think there were concerns on certain interviews uh, that were being done at the time so that's what happens he flips now we've got one and then the decision was made that ed needham who had been talking and had a relationship in a good way somewhat uh, you know that cagey investigator <laughs> You know, of going to talk to Salim al uh, who he had been talking to, and he was the kind of key guy behind telling everybody to lie. And believe it or not, Salim al had wanted to be in law enforcement. He actually worked at a prison, a correction center for youth. Um, that was his job. And uh, what happened after we had the, uh, the, the flipping of the one in Bahrain, uh, we went to Salim. And Ed did a tremendous interview and got Salim Alwan now to cooperate uh, towards the end of the first week of September. And now we had it. We had uh, the validation. We had the U.S. attorney. In this case, it was Bill Hochul, who was just a bulldog. You know, one of the best. He, and he was an organized crime prosecutor. You know, so he was a drug prosecutor that, that uh, was, was key to a lot of it. Plus, investigators were like that think, you know, you probably work drugs in your career and things like that, you know, very aggressive you had to be. And he was that way. So what ends up, we're now staged for charges. We're now staged to do what we need to do. Uh, and we start to orchestrate this and, and get arrest warrants uh, on September, believe it or not. And people, you know, kind of said, well, you guys timed it that way. And I say this and I say this with my hand on a Bible. There was no timing to do this you know, on September 11th of 2002, one year later. It happened, and we actually did it on September 12th. And the takedown began on that Friday. We had uh, arrest warrants for material support to terrorism based on the uh, witness interviews. Uh, we had arrested those individuals. The one in Bahrain, uh, we sent over the FBI G5 airplane to bring him back on a rendition, right, from uh, Bahrain uh, into Niagara Falls Air Base. And... Uh, that Friday, we started to execute the warrants and the search warrants and to uh, bring all these individuals in. And, and that in itself was a crazy three days, two days. I mean, um, I remember on Thursday night, September 10th or no, actually the 11th, being in uh, my chief counsel, my media rep, uh, Paul Moscow, in his office and looking out over the city, you know, the center of Buffalo there by the we're right next to City Hall. And there's a circle there. Uh, they call it the square. And I said, you know, Paul, I said, I think this is going to get some attention, you know. He goes, well, <laughs> he says, I don't know. He said, we had a lot of attention. And I allude back to the case of uh, James Cop. He said, we had a lot of attention on that case. Well, I'm telling you, you know, that, that was Thursday night. Another thing happens is we're orchestrating this on Thursday night. And this is, this is really about leaks. He comes into my office probably about 8 o'clock at night. He said, boss, he said, we got a problem. 
I said, what's the problem? He said, I got a call from, I want to say his name was Jim Stewart, from CBS. <laughs> I said, no. He said he has information, and he, and he had it. And, of course, the way things are done by the media people, and you were one. He, long story short on that, he convinces him not to do anything, and then we will work with him as soon as this becomes public. But he had the information. And, 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 again, <laughs> and again, we do that yeah. because of safety concerns yep. more so than anything yep. else. And he agreed, but uh, we, we found out later we think that information came from the Department of Defense. It didn't come from us. But what was really funny was he then picks up the phones, this guy Jim Stewart, and without saying anything, goes to the, uh, I think it was CBS, the affiliate in, in Buffalo, <laughs> and asks for them to, hey, uh, I'm doing a story. Can you give me some footage of, uh, like, the mosque uh, down in Lackawanna? <laughs> so, and they had no clue. No clue. And when that case broke, they were like, what did we just do? They had no end. So he never, he never did uh, leak that story. But that Friday, um, night, we had surveillance on everybody and, and the, uh, we were, uh, in. It was that important that I went with Ed Needham, Dave Britton, the U.S. attorney and the prosecutor to, uh, the judge's office to sign the warrants. Okay. And we're, we're staged. We're ready to go. And we go in uh, to get the warrant signed and it showed the importance. You know, we were there. He knew it. And uh, the one thing about the judge, Judge Arcara, one thing he was adamant was nobody's allowed to bring a cell phone into his office or courtroom. You know? And I had one and I, I turned it off and I knew what the rules were, but we had everybody staged and, and he's talking about the case. He's reading the warrants, you know, and I'm looking at my watch, you know, I'm like, you know, we got to get this thing going. And he, he was a tremendous, tr a great judge, you know, and he start to sign and lean up again and ask more questions, but more of, you know, the curious uh, curiosity. And he couldn't believe this was going on. And he starts to sign the warrants. He looks at me, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, Pete, he said, you have your cell phone. I said, well, oh, yes, sure. <laughs> I do. He said, well, you have my permission. He said, this is the only time I've ever given anybody permission to use a cell phone in my courtroom. He said, make the call you have to make. And we made the call and we executed the arrests that night. But I'm sure the people would like to understand that things really go smoothly every time you do arrests, right? Well, first of all, I have to ask you, why <laughs> at night? Because that's not usually our, you know, MO. Oh, right, that's because we were, we had to execute as soon as we had the warrants signed. By the time we got the warrants, we, we got the, uh, informations, which are the, the warrants. And we got it. That was going on with the information coming in that Friday during the day. We didn't have time to plan this out and then let's execute this by the next day. It had to be done. You know, that's the pressure that was going on. They couldn't understand why we didn't arrest them a month before. Why, why don't you have what you need to have? And I said that before. This was a different issue with U.S. citizens. So it just took that time, but we were not going to wait to the next morning. You know, we just had to, uh, while we had everybody as the term is in pocket, in place, and we, we had to do it then. And we had search warrants too. We had a lot of search warrants to execute, uh, that we did come up with information, uh, that we needed, uh, you know, that bore people with the evidence, but we validated everything. But, but that night, what was interesting was, you know, you're, you're the head of the office and you're there and everybody's doing things and you've been on a, Bunch of arrests, Jerry. I know that. And of course, surveillance teams, they had everybody in place and the arrests go on. And so I think everything is good. I called down to headquarters and told Pat DeMuro that, you know, okay, everybody's in custody and it's good. That wasn't the case. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, uh, so, no, no. Oh, so God. was it somebody uh, still out there? Yeah. As somebody, they say, in the yeah. wind? Ed Needham comes in to me and he goes, we got a problem. I said, Ed, we need to stop telling me we have problems. <laughs> so, and he tells me, and what happened was we had a surveillance, but we were on the, the one of the individual's brothers. It was not him. We execute the arrest and find out. We get the phone call. It's not him. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, or, yeah, so you can imagine. So what, what then transpires the hours, of course, I have to call down and tell Pat tomorrow around 10 o'clock that night. I said, Pat, we don't have one. He goes, you're kidding me. I said, no. And he did the right thing. He said, Pete, he said, I'll give you the sun up tomorrow. <laughs> And I said, that's fair, Pat. I said, you know, we're, we're on this. I said, we will, we will find him. And that night was, uh, you know, some interesting things we were trying to do where there was one, no, we found his car, what was important. And this is kind of what's important to this about the cooperation of the, of the community was just incredible. We had a, the head of the, uh, Muslim, uh, uh, public action committee, Dr. Khalid Kazi. He was actually, uh, Jerry, we had these citizens academies, as people know, and, uh, 
the Citizens Academy. We bring in people from uh, outside, and he was going to be in our citizen and was in our Citizens Academy that happened to start two days after 9 11. So the question was, is he going to show? Actually, we canceled that one. It was the next one. Well, Khalid Kazi was, was very helpful, and the surveillance team had picked up the car. We had this individual by a mosque. And the team was getting ready to go into the mosque. And I went, no, we stopped that. I said, hold everything. We're not going into a mosque, you know, to see if this guy is in there. And what happened was, you know, Ed Nita made a great recommendation. He said, Pete, he said, you've got a great relationship with Dr. Kazi. He said, let's call him. And I did. And Dr. Kazi said, Pete, he says, where are they? He said, I will go down there and broker the thing. So our agents could go in there and find and see if he's in there. And he did that. So the community was just it was very helpful. There were concerns, as you remember, after 9-11, um, you know, threats against uh, uh, Muslims that were going on. And, and we had our issues in Buffalo, like every other office did. And uh, we went publicly with the U.S. attorney. I did a press conference of just telling anybody, if anybody decides to take their law in their own, hand, their own hands, we will, we will be swift to act and do whatever we have to do. But the community... Uh, was very cooperative. And of course, I had called him to tell him what was going on because that's one thing you had to do. When the arrest started, I called him. He was a spokesman for the community and he appreciated that. So what happened the next morning, it was probably about 4.30, 5 in the morning. You know, it was so important. The ASAC was on the street, you know, <laughs> trying to find this guy. And that What? Morning, An ASAC on the street? <laughs> hey, I was almost on the street. You know, when, you know, when an SAC shows up, then things can't be good. <laughs> oh, you know? that's the truth. <laughs> I had other issues. but uh, And I tell these because they were funny anecdotes to the story. Well, what happened was a brand new agent, this kid, I'm like, Brian something, I wish I could remember his name. This kid, I don't think he'd been in division a week. And he was out on the surveillance. And... uh he actually apprehends the individual. <laughs> so he tells, you know, I call him in. I said, hey, Brian, you know, he says, well, boss, he said, it wasn't that hard. I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, he says, I'm on the car. He says, I see this guy walking down the street. So I get out of the car and he starts walking to me. He goes, I think you're looking for me. <laughs> and he arrests him. I said, okay. Uh, the, the, I, I said, the best arrest story ever. <laughs> and I said, but I'm going to tell you. And I actually, I told the director, actually, in the press conference that Saturday morning, I told him it was a new agent, brand new, that, that made the arrest on one of the guys. I didn't tell him we had lost the guy, believe me. You know, but I was able to call in and say everybody was in pocket by five, five o'clock in the morning. But I told this agent, I said, well, the story is he came up to you, you tussled, you threw him over the car, you wrestled, you handcuffed him, and you brought him in. <laughs> I said, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. So anyway, that's how we get everybody in. And then it all hits the fan on the press. I woke up that next morning. I'm in the office and I could have swore. I, I thought there was more, there were more satellite dishes um, in that square that you couldn't even get a, another one in there. I'm like, oh my God, what do we have? You know, this is just crazy. I was asked by the director and the U.S. attorney uh, that the, we were to fly down to Washington. We did a press conference in Washington. All I worried about was getting back to take care of the, you know, the, we had to deal with our own people, you know, our own media. You know, it was, again, it was a lot of questions, a lot of issues, a lot of concerns. This hitting that city and that town and for the Muslim community, it was like another blow. You know, you had 9-11 and what people thought of that community, and then you had this. Mm. Um, very, very, very tough times. But and the, just a year after. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, but the unity uh, of, of the community working with uh, the, uh, the Muslim community, the law enforcement community, we got through that fairly easily. And uh, we had the support of the community uh, on, on these individuals. And of course, we said, you know, look, everybody's innocent until proven guilty. We had the press conferences and, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it was an eye opener for me. I could tell you that. And, and, and having a good staff of people, especially the media people to help me through that and, and making sure the U.S. attorney and myself were doing what we had to do to, you know, put the face forward, talk what we could talk about, you know, um, and, and to, uh, assuage the fears of, of everybody that, you know, we were doing our job. So it did turn out to be, you know, the first terrorism case. It was the first use of the Patriot Act that was signed, uh, by the Attorney General in May of 2002 with those changes where we were easily able to share that information and do what we had to do that led to the arrests uh, of the individuals. Um, you know, and, and then that leads now then into the issues of they, they all did plead guilty. The, the kind of the end of the story. They did cooperate. They gave us the history of what they did, how they did it. And, and what I think is important here, you know, they all, all of them served jail time. 
the longest jail time was served by an individual by the name of Yaya Goba, who was more of a leader in that from the standpoint of the organization and moving people uh, and, and the trip. I think he, I want to say he got 11 years. I think the shortest was six. But what's important here was, and, and I think people need to understand this, they, they all cooperated. And again, they couldn't go back overseas and go to the camps. I mean, by then we were in the middle of a war. But the histor- historical knowledge of, of all of this helped law enforcement um, with that understanding of how the recruiting of, of and how somebody could be, uh, you know, recruited to do this or become a jihadist. And, and it led to a lot of understanding. And these individuals actually cooperated uh, from the standpoint of even uh, help with some of the training, you know, after they got out or during, too. We had some other other things that were important when we were trying to validate it. There was an individual... Uh, um, they called him Jihad Jack, who was an Australian that was actually in the camps, and the Australians were working a case on him. And our individuals, a couple of them testified because they knew him and knew him in the camps, and they testified, uh, you know, by video in Australia uh, on that case. Um, we we had the uh, gosh, who was the one? Uh, yeah, you know, you probably know, and I just had looked it up too. But he was the U.S. citizen who was caught right at nine eleven. Uh, uh, oh gosh, he just had his name convicted and went to jail. Um, he was in the camps, but was caught fighting against uh, U.S. troops. Yeah, I don't know the name. No, I know. I, I have. Oh, John Walker Lynn. John, John Walker Lynn was actually in Alexandria, and uh, Ed Needham uh, thought, and he was correct, that maybe we should interview him prior to all of this, trying to, again, validate the information. And John Walker Lynn believed that he had been in the camps when they were there. You know, he couldn't recognize the photos, but he said he, he did hear certain people and was there uh, when uh, Bin Laden was in there in the room with everybody and he believes that the Lackawanna people were there uh, when Bin Laden came to the El Farouk training camp uh, in Afghanistan. So a lot of this history came up and it was very helpful in the long run and now we're what 18 years later and you know people don't even remember this case sometimes given some of these things that are happening uh, in this day and age and then the ISIS issues in the last 10 or 11 years. Um, and we even had some periphery people here. We never charged that were part of this. Um, we never had enough to charge them. Another one, an individual was named Arafat Nagy. And on night of the arrest, uh, Nagy approached the outer perimeter of the surveillance uh, team while the search warrants were going on and came up to one of the agents. He was from Newark because uh, we had, you know, a lot of divisions in working in this case. And he said, I think you're looking for me. <laughs> and of course, you know, he was a target, but we could never prove it. And, uh, you know, the agent calls to the command post and talks to Ed Needham and Ed comes in and says, you're not going to believe this one. And, and he was trying to turn himself in. And the Newark agent was instructed, just tell him, hey, no, we're not looking, not looking for you. And he, he was incredulous. He was upset that he wasn't important enough to be arrested by the FBI. Um, we did interview him later, but he wasn't a target. And then, uh, go forward and you look at this, uh, I want to say five years ago, Nagi, who never was indicted in this case or whatever, ends up being indicted on going over to provide material support to ISIS out of Detroit. Obviously, um, he didn't learn anything. Did from, not learn. Yeah. yeah. And he, he was kind of a little crazy. I mean, just, you know, that's why they didn't take him to the camps, frankly, because they didn't want him to be part of their uh, initial group. So that's how it, it kind of all ends. I mean, I we could keep going on this and if you have any other questions, but but what happened is, you know, they were charged. Uh, everybody pled guilty. Um, you know, it, the sensation of it, uh, I think most importantly, the takeaways. And you had, as the years went by, people saying, well, were they really terrorists? I mean, I, I think it's a fair question. It was explored in, you know, articles and, and some of the news clips as the years go by. And that pendulum of we need to do things starts to come back as we see in law enforcement and, and other things over the years, I know you've seen it. And my answer to that was, well, at the time we didn't know. The question was, were they a sleeper cell? Oh my God, are they a sleeper? Well, the, the way I sum it up is, first of all, you can't ignore what happened. Okay. Um, just because we're making this determination, ah, oh, they just didn't mean it. You know, you could ignore that, especially after 9-11, there was no time for that at all. You know, you had to deal with this. So you had to deal with, were they a sleeper cell? And, and, I, I think the best way to sum this up when you look at the investigation of the people they were involved with, Camille Derwish, uh, who was a key figure in this and, and ended up, uh, we never were able to charge him. He was in the, uh, indicted under the name of A. We weren't even allowed to mention his name, which I can 
never understand what the big deal was. Well, he ended up, and I can say this, it's public, but in October of 2002, he ended up on the wrong side of a predator drone attack over in Yemen. So he was killed uh, in the attack. He was not the target. It was a, another terrorist that had bombed a French oil tanker and it, was in, it just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the point I say is, you know, these, these individuals, I think their loyalty, the question would have been if, if Camille Derwish had called after they'd gone to the camps, he had a friendship with them and said, Hey, look, he said, I got two, two of my buddies are coming in through Toronto. They're flying to Toronto and they want to come to Buffalo. And, you know, can you, can you get them to the mosque so they can pray? And, and they want to, you know, go to the community college or whatever. And they would have done anything they can for this guy. And then these two individuals might have been two people that would go out and blow up the peace bridge that connects Canada and Buffalo. Who knows? But they would have rather done something like that, would have never told anybody. And I mean, it's, it's an extrapolation, but the question is, were they? I can't say they were or they weren't, but I was not going to take that chance. Yeah, I guess the other thing to, to bring up is sure. when you talk about allegiances, Yes. right after 9-11, yes. did any of them come forward? Exactly. And that's exactly the point. You know, their allegiance would have been to Derwish and not to us, not to the country, not to, you know, I should say us. It was their country, you know, and and I, I think in hindsight, they realized that, you know, um, what if they had come? And that's where we actually said that, I believe, to Salim Awan. And, you know, what if you would just come forward? You know, it would not have been what actually turned out to be. I, I just don't think, and you ask me truthfully, 18 years later, if that case had gone and the same way it goes, if it was today, I don't think, I think we could have handled this and let this play out a lot longer. We would have determined that uh, they were idiots for doing what they did. There's still no excuse of what they did, but I don't think they would have been given 10 years in jail and six years. I, I don't know. It's hard to say, but at the time and our fears and our concern, which were totally justified. The right thing was done to initiate an investigation and take it to the ends and every end that it could and validate all of that information that has now been documented and, and why these people did what they did. They told us. Um, I think they were youth that were being misled. I think they were looking for something. And that's how the jihadist uh, recruiters, Derwish and, and uh, Aldasari, put that pressure on them um, and, and made them look inward and the reason for making the trip was the determination and, and Bin Laden asked them, actually, you know, they said this in their interviews, Bin Laden asked them, would Americans, you know, Muslims die for the cause? He was asking that. You know, I mean, you know, so he knew he had Americans in that camp. That's why he met with them. And that to me, you know, why didn't you come back and tell us all of this? Why didn't you? Well, they were afraid and I can understand that. Uh, but still, it was pre 9-11. You know, after 9-11, I could definitely feel, see why they were afraid. But this all happened before 9-11. Um, maybe had they come forward and said Bin Laden had been talking about a big surprise kind of a thing, you know, just a, you know, was that going to be another thing that could, would have, could have, should have? We don't know. Um, we can all hindsight's twenty twenty, And I refuse to go back and look at things like that. You know, my point is, and the investigators, the, the Ed Needham's, the Dave Britton's, you know, all of the office, we all believe that we were dealing with terrorists you know and our job was we start with the fact they're terrorists and then what we found out at the end of it was well idiots but will they be loyal would they have been loyal and that i can't answer you know um but uh we did the job that had to be done and i'm not going to sit there and and you know you have people questioning now when you we do some of these reverse terrorism investigations where somebody wants to kill somebody we insert undercover agents and that criticism well they might be mentally ill and my answer on that, when I, I do these these TV news discussions, is, look, we're not psychologists. We don't judge that. You know, our job is there's a crime here, you know, and our job is to do what we have to do um, to prevent to, it, to uh, make sure that people are protected from people like this. Uh, we're not psychologists that can tell a per person's mentally ill. Let the courts decide that. Well, let you me know? ask you an important question. Sure. All right. So all of these people were sentenced and. 2002. Was yes. that correct? That's and, correct. They, and they got anywhere from six to, to 10 years. Well, that means they're all out now. Yes. So when you have a question of whether they were radicalized, uh, you know, and about their allegiance, they're still American citizens. They're still living here. What's going, you know, what's the, yeah. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying. Well, I wish I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I retired in 2006. I still talk. I, the person I've seen Ed Needham uh, quite a few times between well, now not and then. E- not, not even them in particular. I just oh, okay. mean as far as the, the whole concept of having somebody who, you know, had questionable allegiance, who didn't provide information, and, and, and now they're back out. And, you know, I don't know. Well, there were a lot of questions on that. People were asking. I remember getting calls uh, on that, you know, out of Buffalo, and I'm retired. And, well, is the FBI following them? I mean, are we, you know, are we making sure? How do you know they won't, you know, fall back to what they did before? And, uh, you know, that answer is, well, you know, they're on probation, they're parole now, and they've got, you know, they've, they, they've got other people looking at it, but the FBI just can't follow them. And, and the other thing is you couldn't send them back to their countries because they're here. But by all yeah, indications, this, this is their yeah, country, right? And and I think by all indication, I have you know, except for that one guy, Arafat <laughs> Nagy, that wasn't right in the head anyway, and look what he went out and did. They're all leading, uh, you know, lives. They they uh, on their own accord, uh, you know, helped put training programs together with Ed Needham and stuff. You know, that I thought that was that was kind of uh, we need to give back here for some of the things that we did. I think some of them are still bitter. Uh, what happened to them? You know, the, the attorneys that were involved, they wanted to fight it. There was no, uh, there were some, cause they even thought they were going to get sent to Guantanamo. There were some people at high in the administration, without mentioning names, that thought they were going to put tanks in Buffalo and had wanted the military to take over this investigation. And, you know, I had never heard that. Um, cause again, that, that would have been a, a big issue on my end of, um, and the bureau and the director uh, on, you know, posse comitatus, but that, that fear was just, pervasive after 9-11. It's understandable, but we need to have some control on this. You know, we, we are in the United States, you know, and have a constitution we're sworn to uphold and defend. But all this stuff was was running around at that time in these these beliefs. And that was the kind of attention where before 9-11, we were working this the way it should have been worked. And I think in this day and age, if this case, that letter hit the office tomorrow, then it would have been, okay, let's, let's work this. Let's see what we can do. Let's, you know, do we need to put an undercover agent in should we do this should we try to co-opt them to become and you know uh, work with us and all those things would be done today but after 9 11 and what we had and they were u.s citizens there was no tolerance for play the long game and i could understand that because things were different after 9 11 and as i've said three times now that pendulum shifted so fast to one side and i remember sitting in uh, it was kind of, kind of a tongue-in-cheek in a jttf meeting when we were implementing the Patriot Act and saying, you know, well, can we, can't we? And my CDC, Paul Moscow, made that determination, a memo from the attorney general saying you will do and you can. And I would always end that meeting by laughing and saying, well, you know, five years from now, I said, you're going to come visit me in jail because they're going to look back at this and someone's going to make a change and that pendulum will shift back. And we've seen that. We've seen that in the last years on on some of the data collection issues, which, you know, I, I think should be looked at. That's, that's our democracy. But that pendulum was shifted back. I could see when we're implementing something that was approved in May of 2002. And then in 2006, they say, no, 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 you overstepped. So now we have to go back and, you know, punish the investigators. Uh, we had that happen in the Bureau back in the early 70s of, of the interpretation of, of the wiretap acts of uh, the uh, the Omnibus uh, Crime Control Act of 1968 that allowed it. Before that, it was an investigative technique to tap a telephone, you know. So those were the concerns of we're implementing a new, new uh, act, um, never been tested in court. And, you know, we were, we were the tip of the spear on that. And believe me, I'm not a legal person. You know, well, that's why we had some great legal people advising on that during this investigation. So. It was the early days, and now I think the Bureau's got their tripwires out. They understand how this is being done. You know, our generation is left. The new generation uh, is taking over and, and doing what they have to do to get this done, uh, you know, under the rule of law, which is important. Wow. That is just fascinating. And you have made me even that more eager to get somebody on to talk about the Fort Dick Six case. Which, oh, I remember that one. Yeah, that was out, out of Philadelphia. That was Philly. Sure yeah, was. in 2007. Yeah, ta- I was the media <laughs> person at the time. So I, and we had the press conference with Chris Christie. I remember that so well. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. and on the steps of Camden. And I just remember all the media, but that case is very similar to this, except for they actually took 
action. They actually went out in the woods and, and yes. did their own training camp. So I know the case agent. I'll be contacting him to, to see if we could do that. Just to kind of get a little better understanding of, of, of your motivation. And I did already read your, your <laughs> bio to everyone, but I would like to know, you know, when you joined the FBI and most importantly, why you joined the FBI. That's interesting. Um, I, w- I was a senior in, in college. I, I went to Rutgers University and actually, um, I was an agricultural business major. You know, I was an Aggie and I actually used that one time after 9-11 uh, when there was allegations of anthrax and dairy farmers, you know, having terrorists taint their milk. But I started to look uh, at my senior year of going into law enforcement. And honestly, I said, well, geez, I had gone on a tour of the FBI, which it's a lot of people you know, interested back in the day. And I said, well, why not start? You know, uh, I'll start with the Bureau. You know, I didn't necessarily want to be a police officer, but I was just starting to, to experience that. When I graduated, I actually went into the FBI uh, as as a, a back in the day we said cl- a clerk. I was a clerk. Uh, um, I wanted to. That was a path forward to become an agent. You know, if you were a support person and you were there for three years, uh, get your three years work experience, and you know you didn't get in any trouble or whatever, then you could compete to become an agent. And then uh, they changed all of that. In 1978, when Director Webster came in, and uh, what I did was I went back to school to get an accounting degree to make myself more competitive, as they say, because that's what they were hiring, a lot of accountants, lawyers. The point is I wanted to go in. I wanted to uh, be part of the organization. I wanted to do what I could to help people. That was my understanding of it. I wanted to be an investigator, and that's that's what I that was my mission. And, you know, I, I said that's what I'm going to try to do at one point uh it wasn't looking very good, and I actually left the FBI. I was I, I became a financial analyst in the FBI. They call them back then; they were accounting technicians. So I got my degree, and I was working that way. And they said things probably weren't going to work out, so I left and went to the state of New Jersey Attorney General's office to do investigations into Medicare and Medicaid fraud. Probably the best thing I did because six months later I was at Quantico, and went in. Uh, I just turned twenty four, and I went in uh, in April of nineteen seventy nine, and. I wanted it. I, I thought it would be exciting. I thought it would be rewarding. I look back now and I'm starting to write down before I forget them, you know, do memoirs that I'll never let, you know, it's just to remember things. And you have the same thing as well as uh, so many other uh, investigators, whether you be FBI, DEA, uh, police officers, they remember the things that they did that were game changers. And, and I, I believe me, when we did this Lackawanna case, it, it was tense, but we had fun. We laughed a lot because if you didn't laugh, you'd be crying. You know, after 9-11, it was, it was that bad. The most rewarding part of that is being able to help people and make a difference. And when you realize sometimes that you didn't do it the right way and you question yourself like we have with 9-11, the only thing you can do is you got to do it and you got to be better. You know, and I've said this before, you know, we're the FBI, we're 99%. We're not perfect, but we can be 99%. But that 1% will drive you crazy if you're not doing it right. But that's why I joined. I wanted to be part of something like that. And uh, and so I figured I'd start there at the top and work my way down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you retired in 2006. So yes. what are you doing now? Well, when I retired in 06, you know, uh, I was the other opportunities. I was 52. I could have retired at 49. And uh, you always look. And I do now. Uh, one of the things I do is I'm now helping with the Retired Agents Association as a career advisor, whatever that means you know, of, of trying to help people understand what is their life after the FBI. But I retired and I went to the director of national intelligence. Um, they had stood that as a new office. I was recruited to go there as an employee of the director of national intelligence. So I did that for two years, working this new office that was supposed to coordinate the intelligence community, you know, for uh, 17 members of the intelligence community. And that was a challenge. I did that for two years and then I became a consultant. But to, to make sure people think, oh, you became a security consultant. No, I didn't. I, I In the D.C. area, I'm in the D.C. area, I work with companies to help them understand law enforcement federally, to help them provide services and, con- and win contracts to help develop, let's say, IT systems and things of that nature. And it, uh, it parlayed into a pretty good uh, career as an independent consultant. Um, I've been able to get other people work doing the same kind of thing, but around this beltway, you've heard this term beltway bandits. You know, these are the big companies uh, that do uh, and provide support, contracting support to the government. That's kind of what I do and starting to get out of that now and trying to get a little bit better at golf. 
<laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and see grandkids and spend time with my boys because they suffered over years of me not being around. And, uh, uh, but that's what I do. I'm an independent, independent consultant now and, and, and kind of do pretty much anything that might come along of interest, but mostly helping big companies with their way through working for contracts to help law enforcement and the federal government. Oh, very good. Well, yeah. we're at the end. And <laughs> what I always like to do is to make sure that, you know, my guests have been able to say everything they wanted to say and, and drop those little nuggets of wisdom <laughs> uh, since, uh, you know, we have this audience. So what would you like to say? Your, your last words. Geez, you know, it's kind of caught me. I mean, uh, somebody has said that, you know, in your dying days, you'll never say, I wish I had spent more time on the job than with the family. You know, you, you can't go back and change it, but you can only go forward. Life is short and uh, you need to enjoy it and remember what's important. I know this is supposed to be the last word, so, yeah. so I, I may do I some editing here. <laughs> but you That's say good. that, but you didn't do that. No, no. I was asked to speak at Quantico in front of all new agents classes and DEA and National Academy about this case. It was about this case. And they asked me to stay on and, and talk more after that about the, to the new agents, you know, and, and I know you feel this way too. You know, if, if I, I, I looked out at everybody, there were at least 400 people in that, in that auditorium at Quantico and I would switch seats with any one of those people right now. I do it now to go back to be able to do what I did before. And the reason they asked me to talk was these new agents were worried about, oh, my God, they're going to make me work. And they're going to, you know, the SAC is going to be on me and all this pressure. And what I said to them, I said, your own worst enemy is yourself. I said, you will make this job your hobby. I did it. You did it. You know, we we put ourselves out on this thing, um, you know, at the sacrifice, just like, you know, police officers and a lot of other people. But that was it. You know, you will make this your hobby. And just remember. You know, you have to have a life. I used to make a joke. I'd walk around the office at six o'clock telling people to leave because I don't leave until everybody's gone. I used to say that. Of course, that wasn't true. But I said, go home because we realize that, you know, uh, but that's what the job does, you know, uh, and, and so many other people, military, were, were like that. But remember, the important part is family. There's no doubt about it, you know, and, and I forgot part of that sometimes. And that, that's, that's sad. But now you look back and you try to make up the days that you miss, and that's, that's what we do. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Peter A. Hearn, articles providing more information about the Lackawanna 6 investigation, a photo spread of all of the Lackawanna 6 individuals, a copy of that anonymous letter that was received, and a map of the arrest and searches conducted in this investigation. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast, and subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Thank you for listening to the very end. Don't forget to sign up for my reader team. There's a link to join in your podcast app's description of this episode. And also check out my books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, A Manual for Armchair Detectives, and Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, the first two books in my Philadelphia Corruption Squad trilogy featuring flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler. All of my books are available as ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks wherever books are sold. If you've already picked up a copy, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.